Okay, so the last part of this packet is mostly descriptive. We're going to be talking about the strength of covalent bonds and then how different types of bond essentially lead to a net pole or dipole in a molecule, like a plus end and a minus end. We kind of saw that already when I talked about tractors and trailers with water, right? So water has a permanent dipole. That's a consequence of its geometry and its bonding, okay, which we'll get to. All right, so strength of bonds first. So what makes a strong bond? What makes a weak bond? Well, as we saw in the thermodynamics packet, and, you know, as we saw in the kind of the appendix to that uh, packet as well, Bond enthalpy, so an average Cl-Cl bond, you know, I take a bond of Cl2 molecules, break that mole of bonds to get atoms that costs 242 kilojoules per mole, okay? So that's called bond enthalpy, measured in kilojoules per mole, okay? Now, what makes bond enthalpies high? What makes bond enthalpies low? What makes, essentially, for strong and weak bonds, okay? So it's kind of common sense, actually. Let's take a look. So, oh, start the timer. Which do you think of these two, and it's kind of a simple question actually, which do you think is stronger, a carbon-carbon single bond or a carbon-carbon double bond? Well, carbon-carbon double, right? Okay, so this is stronger. Why? Well, it's just a simple concept. Instead of kind of holding hands once like a single, we're holding hands twice, like the legendary Scottish country dancing, okay? So we'll write it down here in the in the box, right? So, double bonds, because you're holding on twice rather than once, you're sharing two pairs of electrons rather than one. Double bonds are approximately twice as strong as single bonds. And we can also say triple bonds, if we ever see one, are approximately three times as strong as single bonds. So the bond order is super important. It can't, that's your first league table. So triples will be any double, any double will, will always be a single. But within those three leagues, right, the triple, the double, and the single bond leagues, there are variations, okay? So there's, you know, the strongest triple bond and, and the weakest triple bond. But the weakest triple bond will always be stronger than the strongest double, okay? So think about three separate leagues, right? Okay, now, <clears throat> If we look down here, we have two single bonds, right? So they're going to be close because they're both single bonds. They're both the weakest kind of bond, single bond. But one's CO and one's CC. Turns out, if you said, oh, this one is stronger, you're correct, okay? Why? Because it has what we call a polar component. So the electrons are a little bit drawn to the oxygen because that's a little bit electronegative, right? So if you like, the electrons, this is, a, this is what's called a polar covalent bond, right? The electrons are a little bit drawn over there, so they're not exactly in the middle, they get a little bit drawn to oxygen. That makes that a little bit minus, that makes that a little bit plus, plus attracts minus, right? So they're actually a little bit stronger bonded. So polar covalent bonds, where we have atoms with a difference in electronegativity, polar covalent bonds are stronger than regular covalent bonds. We'll see this in more detail in the last packet. And it's based on the magnitude of the electronegativity difference, right? So if there's a big difference in electronegativity, it's a big charge separation, it's a stronger bond, okay? So, we can make a note here. Polar covalent bonds and they're formed between non-metals of, I use a little code, difference in electronegativity, right? So if I have two atoms from the top right of the periodic table, if they have a difference in electronegativity, and if you think about it, unless they're the same atom, they will, right? The magnitude of that difference is essentially how far apart they are. So, so fluorine with carbon, that's a big difference in terms of space, right? It's a big difference in terms of electronegativity. They have a big dipole, okay? So polar covalent bonds, Plus and minus n, that's called a dipole. It's a stronger bond, a pol polar covalent bond. Okay, so polar covalent bonds are formed between non-metals of different electronegativities. The electrostatic component increases 
bond strength. As we'll see later, the strongest bond in nature is an ionic bond, okay? The weakest is a pure covalent bond. And polar covalent kind of sits in the middle because it has a little bit of plus and minus character when you have that difference in electronegativity, okay? All right, now, moving on. We did this before, <laughs> okay? Real simple, if you wanna look back and um, look at uh, the enthalpies, bond enthalpies in the thermochemical packet, you can, all right? But real simple, you can work out the bond enthalpy of a CH bond given this thermochemical equation. So if I take CH4 and break it into all its atoms, what do they do? Well, I basically broke one, two, three, four, so therefore, the CH bond, because there's four of them, 1660 divided by four, which equals, should be able to do that in my head, 415. So if you look at that table of bond enthalpies, a, a, a carbon hydrogen bond, 415 kilojoules per mole. Looking in the back, yeah, I do have it. So, oh, there it is. Carbon hydrogen, it says 414, you know, average numbers here, okay. All right, so check out that um, train timetable-like <laughs> list of bond enthalpies. You've seen it before, okay. So remember the thermochemistry packet. We've done it before, okay. Now, We've done this before actually, so I, I've got it in the notes still, it's kind of an artifact. If you look back at the thermochemistry packet, you'll be able to work out the bond enthalpy for the combustion of methane, and it was 8, 10 kilojoules per mole, minus 8, 10. That's what we did before. So flip back, and if you remember, it was this one. Now we can, you know, if I just kind of remind you, it was one of these, two of these made, I think it was one of these. And two of these. So, four carbon hydrogen bonds, two oxygen oxygen bonds, two CO bonds, double bonds, and four OH bonds. If you work out the difference between them, we did this before, you can get eight, 10, minus eight, 10 kilojoules per mole. So just, you know, just flip back, take a look at that. Okay. All right. So bond enthalpy trends then kind of mentioned it already, okay? The more ionic character a bond has, the stronger it is. If you think about it, a plus and a minus attract each other really strongly, right? That's called an electrostatic force, yeah? And because atoms are so tiny that those charges are really close together, so they're actually quite a strong bond, right? So when we look at these materials, we've got Everything has Cl in it, right? Okay. We have Cl2, which is a pure covalent bond. That's electronegativity is the same. Electrons right in the middle. That's the electronic density map, if you like. Okay. So the bonding type there is 100% pure covalent. Okay. Then I look at the other end of the spectrum. Let's just jump over here. If I've got a metal and a non-metal, obviously lose a winner, right? Okay. So I get point charges. I get actual atomic ions. So the electron is completely transferred okay that's made a four plus and a four minus electron transferred that's ionic and those are the kind of bonds we saw before all right however when we have hcl now when i got if you look at the electronegativity of h and cl cl is much bigger than h okay they do technically form a covalent bond so that the electrons are between them but they get if you like pulled towards the more electronegative thing so this end of the molecules more minus this ends more plus and we call that a dipole, right? So the separation of charge is a dipole. I now have like a mini ionic bond, a little bit plus, a little bit minus, delta means a little bit, right? And we call that, because that's a dipole, we call that polar, because there's a plus and minus end, and then covalent, because they're not entirely over on chlorine, right? They're kind of 
a little bit over towards chlorine. So that's a polar covalent bond. If we look at the bond strength, it's kind of what we expect. The more charge character in the bond, the stronger it is. There's an asterisk there because that's actually an ionic, not a covalent. But hey, you can see as the ionic character increases, so does the bond strength. Okay, so the more ionic character, the stronger the bond. Okay, so if you were, if these are descriptive problems, right? So if you saw that on a test, it would say, hey, rank these in order of bond strength, the most ionic character first through to the last, okay? Now, before we go on, we can answer the next question very simply, okay? If you remember, literally, I think it was first or second lecture, I, we talked about the difference between solids, liquids, and gases, and how solids were rigid because they were on our particle size level, you know, be elements, compounds, whatever it was, right? Solids, the particles were touching on the inside. Liquids, they were tumbling. Gases, they were well separated. So solids were rigid because the particles were really strongly bonded. And the bottom line was this. If you remember what I said at the time, closer equals stronger. So the closer the particles are to each other, the stronger they bond, right? That explains solids, liquids, and gases. And it also explains a little bit bond strength, okay? So first up, we have our kind of <laughs> league table situation, right? So the question says, complete the following table. What color correlation do you see, right? So we have two single bonds, right? And two double bonds. So these guys are kind of premiership, right? <laughs> this is Liverpool and Man City, right? That's Liverpool, <laughs> right? They're the best two, they're the strongest, right? These are the championship. This is West Bromwich Albion and Nottingham Forest. I'm sorry, I'm using soccer analogies, right? Okay, so they're in a lower tier, they're weaker, right? So double bonds, doesn't matter what's stuck to what, will always beat single bonds. But within that league, those two separate leagues, the most ionic character is stronger, right? So we expect what's the order? We expect the strongest, okay, in order, right, to be one, two, that's a little bit minus, that's a little bit plus, so this double bond is stronger than this double bond. Both of those are stronger than these singles, but that's got some ionic character, that's polar covalent, that's not, so we'd expect three and four, right? So that's our predicted order of strength, right? If I throw in the numbers, that's 805, 611, 351, 347, and that's exactly the trend we predicted, right? So you're never going to uh, be asked to kind of quote the numbers, you just have to do the order, right? Now remember what we said, stronger equals closer, right? So the strongest bond is this one, that should have the shortest bond distance. It's 122 picometers, right? This guy must have the longest because it's the weakest, 154, and then the other is 143. 137. So yes, it holds true. As the bond gets shorter, it gets stronger. Okay, and we know what leads to strength. Double always beats single, and then we add on this kind of polar covalent characters. Difference in electronegativity. The bigger the difference in electronegativity, the stronger that character is, that dipole, right? Okay. Again, more on that in the next packet, the last packet. All right. So here's a classic question. <laughs> it's a classic question. Try it, right? Try these next two by yourself, right? Okay, just pause me, right? <laughs> Must be great having that power to shut me up. <laughs> just press pause, try these questions. All right, you're back. So arrange the following bond coordinates in order of increasing strength and increasing bond length, right? So increasing strength, well, it's an easy one. They're all CN coordinates, but that's the strongest, right? So increasing means weak to strong, right? So C single bond N is weaker than C double bond N, which is weaker than C triple bond N. Okay, so that's the strongest, that's the weakest, fair enough, right? Okay, and increasing bond length. Increasing means gets longer, right? So shorter is actually stronger, isn't it? Remember what we said? Shorter is stronger, the strongest is C triple bond N. So it's the reverse trend. There we go. All right. If you got that one, try this one. Now, this is all within the same league now, right? And all we're looking at is differences in kind of electronegativity, right? So 
bond strength, we want to go weak to strong. This is going to be the weakest, right? There's no polar covalent coordinate at all, right? No, sorry, no polar covalent character at all because it's a pure covalent. What's more electronegative, fluorine or oxygen? Well, who's the winner? Who's Arnold, right? It's fluorine. So the strongest is CF and then CO. Okay. Again, all single bonds, right? Okay. Bond length, short to long. The longest is the weakest. The shortest is the strongest. And then CO. Okay. There it is. Hopefully that makes sense. I've got some numbers here. I've got uh, 347, 351, 439. So they get shorter as they get stronger. Okay. All right. You can look up uh, bond lengths and bond strengths in the appendix. All right. Now, so that's uh, covalent bonds. That's pretty cool. All right. Okay. Now, when we make molecules, and I talked about this, remember my tractor and trailer, right? So let's have a flashback to that when we look at water. All right. But first, let's do something simpler. HCl. HCl is what's called a polar covalent bonded molecule, right? So when I have H and Cl, the Cl has a higher electronegativity, so it pulls electrons that way. So they're not in the middle. They've been pulled a little bit that way, all right? So that means when we draw the electron map, if you like, a little bit minus on this end, a little bit plus on this end, right? And we like to draw like a dipole, like that. That's how we like to draw it. That's a plus end, that's a minus end, okay? So that's the origin of it now. Let's talk about polarity, right? So we have to talk about what's called a net dipole. So there might be a molecule with many polar covalent bonds inside it, right? Sometimes those dipoles reinforce to make a stronger net dipole. Sometimes they actually cancel to give a zero net dipole, right? So you've got to kind of look at this within the context of symmetry, right? Now, because this is a very simple molecule, the dipole runs through the symmetric center of the molecule, right? So this is the minus n, that's the plus. So hey, oh, yeah, that's right, minus the plus. So the molecule has a plus end and a minus end, therefore the molecule, because it has a plus end and a minus end, is polar, right? One polar covalent bond through the middle of the molecule, one side of the molecule is plus, one side is minus. So that's an easy example, right? So HCl, yes, has a net molecular dipole. All right. Now, remember water, all right? Remember water? He's my tractor and trailer analogy for water, didn't I, right? If you remember that, okay, from back in the day. And I said water was awesome because, let's look at it. So there it is, right? I kind of draw it on the side and think about tractors and trailers, yeah. So there are my two OH bonds, right? So oxygen is super electronegative, so it pulls the electrons that way, right? If I draw like a vector diagram, okay, that's plus, that's minus, that's plus, that's minus, those two bonds, right? So it turns out that if you're adding vectors, yeah, if you kind of add them in this way, they actually cancel, but if you add them this way, they reinforce. So it turns out, and there it is, water has a net dipole through its symmetric center. And that's why we said when I talked about tractors and trailers, hey, water has a minus end and water has a plus end. It can back in or it can go in head first, right? So water, and that's a direct consequence of the bond angle, right? As we'll see in the next example, if they were linear, right, it wouldn't work because they'd cancel, right? But because they're nonlinear, they reinforce in that direction. The bond angle in water makes it have a net dipole. All right, now that's not true for CO2. Right, if you look at CO2 for a minute, right? So we say, hey, water has a net dipole. Does CO2 have a net, right? Well, it's interesting because this one's a winner, right? That's a bit minus, that's a bit plus. And then, hey, bit minus, bit plus. They have two very strong dipoles on the inside. So CO2 has two really strong dipoles on the inside, but they're pointing in exactly opposite directions, so they entirely cancel. So CO2 has no net dipole. And when you come to do your lab this week, okay, last lab of the semester, you're gonna have to, one, decide, hey, do the atoms inside, are they polar, right? And if they're different atoms, they will be, right? Okay, and then the question is, well, based on the symmetry of the molecule, are they like CO2 and they completely cancel out, or are they like water and they don't cancel, they sometimes reinforce? And then if there's no perfect cancellation, there will be a net dipole. Some molecules have really weak net dipole moments, right? But they do, all right, but they do. 
on the whole. Okay, so we'll talk about that when we talk about your lab tomorrow. Okay, now, so we talked about molecules, and I had a little asterisk next to my NaCl earlier, right? Okay, turns out there's an analogous thing for ionic compounds, right? Now, the only real difference between kilojoules per mole bond enthalpies for like Cl, Cl, right? That's kind of for covalent bonds or polar covalent bonds, right? Which have direction, so they're holding onto their neighbor, right? Okay. In an ionic compound, because it's just a kind of a lattice of plus and minus ions, now think about it, a plus charge has radiative attraction, right? So it attracts every single minus in the grain of salt towards it, right? Okay. It's just attracting the ones that are closer more strongly, yeah? So theoretically, okay, every plus ion in a crystal of salt is bonded to every minus ion in a, in a crystal table, a little kind of grain of salt, right? Because of the kind of omnidirectional nature of electrostatic attraction, yeah. So charges attract in every direction, whereas covalent bonds just bond with their neighbor, okay? So we can't really compare neighbors because it's not really true. You have to compare everything, right? So what we do when we compare these numbers, we, we compare what's called the lattice energy, right? And that's technically said to be, you know, all the attractive forces between a mole of particles in an ionic compound, okay? The analogy works, we will think about pairs in a moment, but that's what lattice energy actually is. So if anybody asks you what lattice energy is, it's the energy needed to separate, you know, a mole of ions, right? Okay. All right. Now, having said that, we're going <laughs> to completely ignore it because what works from Covalent bonds also works for ionic bonds when we think about pairs. So the trend for lattice energy is the same as the trend when we look at, think about simple pairs, right? Now, first one is the size one, right? So remember, if I have chlorine stuck to these different plus ions, right? So if you think about it, a plus one minus one is a bit like a single bond, right? A plus two minus two is a bit like a double bond, right? And we'll see that in a second when we compare plus one minus one with plus two minus two, okay? But the first one we're gonna look at is size, right? So think about this just for a second. As the plus ion gets bigger, it essentially gets further away from chloride, right? So the distance is getting bigger between the two ions, yeah? So the further away you are, the stronger or weaker the bond. Weaker, right? So we think this is the weakest bond here, and this is the strongest, right? They're both all kind of quote unquote like single bonds because it's plus one minus one. We expect a similar strength. But because the size of the counter ion varies, that's the strongest, that's the weakest. You can look the numbers up in the book. It's a simple concept. Shorter is stronger. So if we've got the same plus one, minus one charge each time, the shortest bond's stronger. The ion pair, the, the smallest distance between the ions, okay. All right, and you know, I think that's an old page quote, but you'll find it in the chapter, you can check the numbers. Last one here, what about the analogy of double bond versus single bond? Well, here I've got Na, F minus, Ca2 plus, O2 minus, and I've chosen them to be approximately the same distance, right? So the bond distance is the same, essentially, yeah? But this is a plus one minus one, this is a plus two minus two, it's the equivalent really in our previous work of single bond versus double bond. What's stronger? Well, plus two minus two is gonna have a stronger interaction than the plus one minus one, okay? And that one, the bond strength is approximately 34, 14, and here it's approximately 9, 10, okay? So it's significantly stronger, okay? Significantly stronger. So the same kind of general concepts apply. Longer is, is weaker, and then Plus one minus one is weaker than plus two. Minus two is like the, the equivalent of a single versus a double bond. Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> one of the, the very simple descriptive questions you may be asked is just to describe the bonding between two atoms, right? So if you stick these two atoms together, what kind of bond do they form? And this is very, very easy if you just have access to a periodic table, okay? Now, remember the golden rule if you have, and there's the line, right? If you have a metal with a non-metal, it's of course, as we talked about before, ionic, 
right? If you have a non-metal with a non-metal, two top righties, it's covalent. But now we're going to add a little caveat, right? It's only purely covalent if they're the same atom. Because if the, even if there's a slight difference in electronegativity, it's technically polar covalent, okay? So three things to think about. One, is it metal and non-metal? If yes, it's definitely ionic, right? Next, if it's two metals, are they the same? If they're the same, it's a pure covalent bond. All right, there's electrons right in the middle. But if it's, even if they're just next door to each other, like N and O, for example, right, the electronegativity is different. The electrons drift over just a little bit towards oxygen in that case because it's more electronegative. It's a polar covalent bond. Obviously, the bigger the separation, the bigger the dipole, right? So things involving hydrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and fluorine, as we'll see in the next packet, are super polar, right? Okay, so we can just look at the coordinate. <laughs> Oxygen gas, O2, obviously, that's a pure covalent one, right? So covalent, okay? OH, two non-metals, yeah? So an OH, two non-metals, but they're separated by quite a difference, so that's gonna be polar covalent. <laughs> NaCl, metal, non-metal, ionic. KF, metal, non-metal, ionic. SF, non-metal, non-metal, difference in electronegativity. Polar covalent. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Deciding what kind of bond exists between two atoms is easy. Just look at where they are in the periodic table. Again, metal, non metals, ionic. Two not the same non metals is polar covalent. Two identical non metals is covalent. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Last but not least, okay. This is essentially the same question I gave you for extra credit a little while ago, okay? But what I'm going to do, I'll just go through it with you, and it does ask for geometry at the bottom, right? So you should have got for your... So if, you, if you just look at it, right, it's PO4, 3 minus, yeah? So it's obviously phosphorus in an expanded octet, which has five bonds, right? If you think about it, there's only one way to stick four things around a center with five bonds, and that's like that. And that's why PO3, PO4 3 minus is a three minus ion, because if you remember, if it's a single stick to oxygen, that's where the extra electron hands, hangs out. So I'll kind of do that. And then, you know, there are, I can put the double bond here, 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 so are there, plus three more, right? Actually, there's times four, as four altogether, right? Okay. Formal charges, well, the minus one is here, here, and here. That's a zero, that's a zero. Hopefully that's what you got, right? Now, in terms of the electronic geometry, I just got enough time to kind of answer this question before we run out, right? Okay. Electronically, one, two, three, four clamps, right? Now, remember, that's a snapshot in time. That's actually a delocalized structure. There's like one and a quarter bonds in each case, yeah, right? but we can't model that. So electronic geometry, four clumps. Four clumps is what? Boom, tetrahedral, right? Okay. And then the next question is, well, what's the molecular geometry? Well, the, luckily for us in this case, there's an atom on the end of each clump, so it's also tetrahedral. So that thing actually looks more like this, right? Okay, so more like a tetrahedral. Okay, all right, stop there. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, we've got a few nice pictures for you in the rest of the packet. But um, see you on the next one. Okay, stop there.